Well, uh, we are back uh, with another episode of the Lead Up Leadership Podcast. I'm very excited about this one because um, I have one of my good, not even good, I would say one of my best friends um, on this episode. He is not only an amazing person and friend, a brother, um, but he's doing amazing things in his field of education, um, you know, even in the podcast world as well. And so... Yeah, just without further ado, I want to introduce my good friend, Chris Garcia, to the Lead Up uh, Podcast. What's up, man? How you doing? Hey, hey, Reynado. Dude, it is so cool to be here, man. <laughs> so glad to be able to partner with you, talk to you, talk vision. It's been, dude, can you believe it? It's been 11 years already since like, yeah. we first met each other. So right, we've come the, a long way. UC Davis days, man. <laughs> That's right. UC Davis, <laughs> Aggies. Yeah. So just um, just to give the, the listeners kind of some context, can you share a little bit about your background, where you're from, um, and then a little bit what you do right now in your, uh, in your role? Yeah, sure. So uh, I am originally from San Diego, um, born and raised, um, did live in Texas for a few years. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm half and half. My dad's from Texas, my mom's from San Diego. And uh, so born into a Hispanic um, home, Hispanic household. And uh, I, I really have just had the opportunity to uh, just see the um, the growth within the, the 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 heritage that I've I've been accustomed to and and I've grown up with, and uh, also seen the challenges that it faces. And uh, growing up, uh, life wasn't easy. My parents um, both did not have a, a college education. They, the high school was as furthest as they went to, um, but even then, for their household, that was like the best thing ever. So my parents always had higher expectations for me. And uh, they went ahead and uh, they always pushed me towards higher education. And um, one of the things that I grew up always was uh, I I have a heart just for people. I have a heart for uh, helping people, seeing people progress, seeing seeing my people progress um, specifically. Um, And uh, I I, uh, always had the question in high school of why are people the way they are? So uh, I, I realized that sociology was a great avenue to go into that. So, um, I went into uh, junior college here in San Diego um, with a focus in uh, just sociology. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do yet. I was fighting between being a lawyer or being an education or a counselor, <laughs> yeah. a social worker. I just knew I, I want to do, I want a degree where I can help people. I want to help people. That's at the end of the day, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I transferred to UC Davis and I, um, and I'm not going to lie, um, UC Davis was hard. Uh, going from a junior college to UC Davis, from a semester program to a quarter system was very challenging. But lo and behold, um, I, uh, I was able to rise to the occasion. Um, and also by the grace of God, too, for a lot of uh, classes and grades and whatnot. And, uh, yeah. But uh, even then, I, I really just um, – I felt when I finished the UC Davis, I was like, all right, I, I want to actually have my focus in education. I mm-hmm. want it to be in education. I want it. Um, I want to influence um, the young minds even more. Um, my mind was. I went through a lot. And this is another podcast for another day. But I went through yeah. a lot of uh, adolescent challenges in uh, in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and yeah. I knew I wanted to give back. <laughs> so uh, all in all, uh, yeah. That long story short, I I got accepted to USD, got my teaching credential, and also my master's in education uh, with. Nice. The, and uh yeah uh, i did a lot of projects on the side there and uh but that led me to different career things now where i'm currently now i'm in year eight can you believe it i'm already officially in year eight of teaching um i am now a resource stem engineering teacher for my district so i have the access to teach over four thousand sixth graders every single year yeah and um in addition to that i'm an adjunct professor at usd and uh, I teach uh, for their online program and in-person program. I teach their mm-hmm. technology, some of their technology courses and yeah. creativity courses. And I'm also the vice president for San Diego Q, which stands mm-hmm. for Computer Using Educators. And uh, it gives me a platform to really inspire, encourage, and help teachers with their teaching practices and being on the cutting edge and using the best tools and practices available. So. Yeah. That's a long story short of yeah. what the last 10 years really have been like with yeah. the education and where I'm at now. So, um, but yeah. And in the middle of all that, meeting you, bro, meeting you, I know, and, right. uh, <laughs> seeing where you've been and yeah. encouraging you and whatnot. So, yeah, 
And before I'm going to touch back on what you currently do and even addressing some of the things, you know, that we're experiencing during this climate, right? The pandemic and online learning, because yeah. that's really your expertise. Uh, but going back to what you're saying about meeting me and uh, I don't know if you remember, right? 11 years ago, we had met and uh, at a progressive dinner event, right? You know, we're going yeah. to different houses and uh, this specific event was, um, I, there was a theme, right? You had to dress up as something or someone that you wanted to be, right? Yeah. In the future, right? And I think you yeah, dressed up yeah. as, a, as a principal and uh, Mark, you know, dressed up as a, something else, right? We won't get it. That's yeah. a different podcast. That's a different podcast, but, yeah. But sticking to you, right? So you dressed up as a principal um, and that, that was something that, um, what I'm trying to get at is you, you landed on education. You knew mm. even probably before that, that education was the field that you wanted to, to get into. And although you're not a principal, you're definitely in the education field and education realm, right? And yeah. um, pretty high up there, right? You got your, I think your admin credential, correct? I did, yeah. I got it two years ago from San Diego State. So another yeah. shout out to another school. <laughs> right. And so I guess, you know, I, I bring up the, the question of, you know, why education? What was it about education and kind of getting to where you are now? Why was that important? Um, and I ask that because, you know, a lot of the, the listeners, you know, based on like kind of the data, uh, a lot of the people that tune in are young adults, young professionals, and a lot of them, like me, when I was still in school, um, even sometimes after school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So for for you, I pay a lot of respect because even 10 plus years, you kind of already knew what you wanted to do, where you wanted to be, and, and what kind of impact. But for a lot of people, they still don't know what they want to do. So kind of talk to me, what was it for you that landed you within education and kind of the journey of how you got to where you are today? Uh, man, that's really good. And um, as you're telling me that, I, I, I think I mentioned this even to um, to the people that you get a chance to work with, the young, the young people. And uh, But when I was around 13 or 14, um, I remember really just diving into like Martin Luther King and seeing like the differences that he made. And uh, it's ironic that I'm bringing that up now just because of what 2020 has brought us. But um, right. there was a phrase that he said once, and it just it's always stuck to me. And that was, and I, I'm going to paraphrase it, but all mm -hmm. in all, the whole principle was Martin Luther King said that education would be the avenue to destroy racism. Mm. And in my mind, I'm like, that can be taken a lot of ways. That can be right. <laughs> getting an education. That can be um, like making an impact in education. So I took it a, a various ways. I took it in a way where how could I educate myself? Um, how could I educate myself where I would learn? And I, like the, the, the reality was this. I wanted to learn everything. Yeah. I wanted to learn what every single piece of silverware on the table when I would go to a fancy restaurant, <laughs> what was the purpose for each one? You know, that's yeah. those little details. Like I need to learn because I figured out the more that I know, the more impact I can have. Hmm. And, um, but then yet I thought, why not make a difference in education? Why not be able to invest into my own classroom, into students that, because I look back and even in my sphere of growing up and there was, the reality was I, I had teachers that, I did not like there was yeah. teachers that I was just I would dread to go to school but then yeah. there were teachers that just completely shifted my mind they made boring subjects fun um, they were relevant and they were the ones that inspired me to get to where I wanted to be at even with the yeah. way I do things currently um, and that led me to several things um, first off I that led me back to the city where actually I was raised in in Chula Vista and mm -hmm. even then, like going in there with my interview and telling them, well, why should we hire you? I was like, well, because I'm local. I was raised um, in these neighborhoods. I can empathize with your students. Um, yeah. I can be a voice. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's not that many males in education. There mm -hmm. aren't that many male leaders in education. And even more for me, there aren't that many Latino uh, leaders in education. And I thought to myself, my story of my challenges that I dealt with in elementary school, in junior high, now I can share those stories with the students. I can talk about, I can specifically and explicitly name the schools that I had challenges in and the students be like, oh, that's where I'm supposed to go to middle school next year. Yeah. And then there immediately the rapport builds up and then the relationships build up. And then the students just something activates in their mind. We're like, oh, I wanna listen to that. Mm -hmm. And um, so to get to where I'm at now, like I, I, I would have never thought, especially when I was in sixth grade, and I'm going to just be real. That was the grade that yeah. I pretty much despised the most. 
Mm-hmm. Sixth and seventh grade, I despise the most. And to think that more than 20 years later on, I would be teaching over 4,000 sixth graders in the city where yeah. I struggled with the most as an adolescent. I mm. mean, the truth is, I, it was at that age of 13 and 14 where I just heard that quote, Martin Luther King saying that education would defeat racism. That really just fired me up. And to this day, it yeah. still fires me up because I look back at what, what's been going on for 2020 and I'm thinking to myself <laughs> like, yup, education yeah. will definitely yeah. defeat all these things that we're dealing with. <laughs> So. Yeah. Yeah. And man, 2020. Yeah. What, what a ride has been. And, and really we've been what shelter in place since like March, probably even earlier, but um, here we are still in this climate. Um, and as educators, right. As we're about to start a, a new school year pretty soon. Um, I want you to kind of just speak a little bit about um, kind of the, you know, what were your, some of your thoughts in the initial phase going into the, the online learning and, kind of like, how are you preparing and how can other educators uh, or the other leaders in the education field um, kind of prepare for what's to come in terms of online learning? And I'll give you a few seconds to think about it because um, I know you did recently a, a session for, for my job, uh, which was amazing for our students, right? Uh, current high school students and, and incoming college students to prepare for online learning because this is gonna be their norm for at least the fall and we'll see what happens in, in the winter and spring, but um, yeah, could you speak a little bit to, you know, what what were you initially thinking and how did you respond when we first went into shelter in place? And then what what do you how are you preparing for what's to come? Well, some of the things that happened in the beginning, um, first off, when this whole shelter in place happened and when this whole at least those people that barely found out about COVID-19 in March or February started thinking about it. Excuse me. Um, the number one thing was just to make sure first off that the students had the basic needs. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very, very important when we first started off with, all right, do they have access first off to food? That was the first thing in the first line of defense that we, that any school district and even the people that I've interviewed and talked mm-hmm. with, that's the first line of defense is food. Do our students have access to that? And then second off, are they okay? Are they going to be safe at home? Do they have a means of communicating? So that's why I get them a device and get them Wi-Fi. And all in all, even uh, the, the beauty about, it was interesting to see how everything came together because when this whole pandemic started, education was focused on the whole child, the well-being of the child. Mm. Um, immediately, the test scores went out the window. The states and the, the federal government, no smarter balance exams. We're not going to do that. Make sure your kids are okay. Um, for teachers like myself and others, it was, it was more focusing on the wholeness of the child, checking in. How are you doing? How are you passing the time? How are you staying safe? How? Um, and it was very much, it was very much just making sure everyone was fine, and yeah. checking in with them. Um, any academics was, and if there were any academics that were brought up, was all review. Um, I know for at least a good part of even the state of California and the way testing is usually structured. Um, by the time March came, we were about a week and a, we were literally a week away from spring break. Um, and traditionally in California, when we come back after spring break, then we're getting ready for testing. So the reality was that we really didn't lose any instructional time. It was more that review time for those exams. So that was kind of like the buffer time that we had. And just everyone just hoping, praying that we would go back to normal yeah. in the fall. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. So now dealing and, and meeting with teachers and talking to them and it seems a lot of the trends on Twitter, um, a lot of the things, first off, the first line of defense again is bringing food back up. So now we're going into the fall. We want to make sure the cafeterias are ready. Everything's ready for that. Second off, again, devices and access, making sure students have that. But the most and the most important thing and the biggest thing that schools are going to be facing and that we're really encouraging a lot of teachers to do right now before um, we continue moving forward is building relationships, thinking mm-hmm. outside the box. How are we going to get to know your students? Because this is different now because we're not teaching students that we had. We're getting mm-hmm. brand new students coming in. Right. So, so we're thinking to ourselves, how are we going to build relationships? How are we going to find creative ways? Um, and one of the things I was talking, actually, a former classmate of ours, Michi Davis, who actually happens to be a teacher, and he was like, okay, what's that one thing I need to be ready for this year? 
And I told mm-hmm. him, you know what? You need to be able to communicate with parents. If there's anything, communicate with parents because that's that's pretty much what they the parents need to feel assured that yeah. everything is going to be okay, that their kids are going to be okay, and that everything is going to be okay. And us as teachers have that calling and that ability to bring that peace to the household. Um, when it comes to learning, when it comes to academics, you know what? A lot of that stuff can fall in place. Yeah. But when students know that they're safe and that they could communicate and parents know that they communicate with their teacher, um, then that's when things can happen. Because if you can get, yeah. and I was telling this, our friend of ours, that's a teacher actually in Lodi, I was like, if you can get the parents on your side, if you can communicate to them some way, somehow consistently, um, and there's avenues for that, there's apps for that, yeah. and I teach all that. But I said, if you can communicate with them and over communicate and you get them on your side, then mm-hmm. in the essence, they'll all at least be able to monitor your students and the work they're going to do. Um, yeah. But moving forward, that's basically the one of the biggest lines of defense is going to be parent communication mm-hmm. and being creative with that. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. And I want to go back to the um, that se- that session that you did for our students. I think if you know whoever's listening to this or watching this, um, if you are currently in high school or about to take the next step to go to college and you are wanting some just practical steps or advice on how to succeed in this online learning platform. Because I know for a lot of students, um, they weren't feeling it. Some are still kind of getting over that hump. Um, But as you know, we've talked about, this is gonna be for some time. So I would highly recommend checking out that uh, video session that's on uh, Chris's uh, YouTube channel. I think it's Mr. Garcia educational page, correct? Yeah, that's it. Okay, perfect, yeah, check it out there. Um, Really good, really good content. Um, and other content, uh, because it's something that I've really uh, seen you grow even in this last year and a half, um, as you've been connecting with other educators in your field and, and even beyond, uh, has been through your podcast, uh, the Innovative uh, Pedagogy Podcast. Uh, so talk to me a little bit um, about the podcast. What are you trying to, what message are you trying to get with that? And, and how did you initially um, get started with that? Yeah, so... Um... The innovative pedagogy, so first off, this whole word of innovation is just really, really big right now in education. And um, But it's really cool because it, it, it's tying into a lot of the STEM field. Um, and when it uh, when we talk to engineers, um, I've been listening to a lot, actually, of uh, the Disney Imagineers podcast and been mm. into some of their sessions. And um, it's really cool to see how the creative outlet of what people have created out there, like like uh, uh, like Elon Musk with the Tesla and, yeah. um, and, and just the SpaceX program and just kind of like yeah. diving into that. And the key word that came to me was innovation. And on top of that, I mean, my job is technically at the innovation station. So right. I thought to myself, you know what, why not? But then the word pedagogy is a term we use in education when it comes to having really solidified teaching practices. So mm. I wanted to take and morph two words together, a, a traditional word of pedagogy when it comes to just the teaching practices of what's yeah. good teaching and what's been good teaching for hundreds of years, but then with the word innovative, because that really forces you to be on the cutting edge, to be yeah. um, uh, uh, giving students what's the latest and the greatest mm-hmm. and putting those two together. And I'm thinking like, I want to have the cutting edge, but so solid and solidified yeah. teaching practices. So um, I've been blessed to have uh, and continue to be blessed to be able to work with a lot of great minds and throughout um, our county of San Diego. And even now, because of my role with San Diego Q, it's one chapter of a national chapter. So I'm connecting with um, innovators and teachers from all over the country to mm-hmm. be able to interview different people and specifically what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, not only just educators in education, but we're doing engineers. Um, one mm-hmm. of the interviews had to do with a journalist. Um, and that specific interview was really powerful because uh, we want to really, in education, we really encourage students to think critically. And yeah. I really wanted to bring the message where thinking critically doesn't just stop in school. It's not just for an oh, essay or a writing assignment. Right. It's, it's, it. something that, it's something that needs to happen consistently, um, yeah. even now, especially because it's an election year. We know what happened four years ago um, where the whole term fake news was brought up. I had never heard that term before. <laughs> other than it was four years ago. And I was like, wow, I've heard the word fake and I've heard the word news, but never in the same like sentence. Mm. And now we've been using it for the last four years. And yeah. I'm thinking to myself like, okay, well then what makes us think critically how in, in order for that to happen? So 
Yeah. Um, it's a, it's an, uh, the whole purpose of this podcast is just to bring some innovative um, and critical thinking and just good teaching practices for teachers to be able to listen to, to be yeah. refreshed, to be encouraged by. I mean, some of the episodes we've even done on there, I've done, and just, it's just talking about boundaries. Um, we're mm -hmm. having a, another episode being released in September um, with actually one of my former administrators um, where he actually suffered a heart attack and he had a whole life altering um, wow. change when it came to his boundaries and work. Yeah. And now he's the assistant superintendent for one of the high school districts here in San Diego, but mm -hmm. he's always kept strong boundaries. So a lot of yeah. teacher wellness is a big factor in it. So um, all in all, it's uh, it's a great avenue that I'm using to just get my voice out there, but also yeah. the voice of friends and really just trying to make an influence within the sphere of education that way. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, and it's something like I've gotten a lot hearing from different educators um, and some of the other people that, in, that you've interviewed, a lot of great content and insight into the specific work that they're doing, which is, you know, that it impacts a lot of, lot of people, right? Not even, uh, you know, specifically students and parents, right? Communities really uh, that are being impacted by the decisions that a lot of these uh, stake, key stakeholders are making. And something that came up as you were talking um, when you talked about cutting edge and kind of getting inside and uh, kind of getting ahead of the game, um, something that's kind of going through my mind is, uh, you know, young people, right? Going back to the, the, the people that either are listening or uh, that, I, that I work with on a daily basis. Um, how, the question that comes up is like, how can I get ahead, right? How, what can I do to kind of separate myself to either, you know, get ahead in my job, right? Or kind of get my foot in the door um, for this, you know, potential career opportunity. Um, those are things that come into my mind. So I guess what advice would you give, you know, seeing where you're at right now in terms of being responsible, like you were saying, like 4,000 students uh, for a district and being able to talk to a lot of these major influencers, um, what advice would you give to, to people to kind of either kind of get ahead or kind of get a leg up in certain things and whatever they're, that they're trying to do? Yeah, that's great. Um, that's a great question. I don't have to say the first thing that comes to my mind is just having a positive attitude. Really mm -hmm. just being able to be that encourage, that en encouragement to whatever field job you want to get into. Um, just have a positive attitude about it. And, and you'll see that people, people will remember that uh, because I look back at it and I think of where I've been and how I've gotten to certain things. Um, becoming an adjunct at USD, first off, I never would have imagined that I'd be actually a university professor um, yeah. teaching. Um, and I'm thinking like, how in the world did I get there? And mm -hmm. one of the things that I remember was, first off, I was always just, um, uh, I would always reply to those alumni phone calls that they would ask for like interviews. And um, and at the same time, I, I long story short, I remember getting interviewed and being asked to show up to campus for a, a video interview and whatnot. I ended up walking around campus and visiting some old professors and I was already in year number four of teaching. And mm -hmm. one of my professors just said, Hey, Chris, come to my office. And we started talking and uh, she started asking like, what have you been doing? Like what's been going on? And I started sharing with her and she said, you know what? You'd be great for an online program. And I'm like, really? She's like, okay. Yeah, I said, she's like, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, okay. So then she got me connected mm -hmm. and, and that's how that happened. Um, even with the job that I have now, we have a partnership um, with uh, Qualcomm and um, the city of Chula Vista. And uh, one of the things that really let my mark on Qualcomm is actually a field trip experience that Qualcomm originally had in Sereno Valley at their headquarters. And I'm never going to forget that uh, when I was there, I was just super excited because the students got to learn robotics, careers, strengths, yeah. um, and interests. And um, I was, I honestly felt, I'm a big Flash fan. Um, I know mm -hmm. you are too. But uh, I remember yep. best superhero. <laughs> yes, right. Um, and uh, but as I was in this, I, I seriously felt like, yeah, this feels like Star Labs. Even one of the mm. instructors looked like Harrison Wells from season one because there was like a wheelchair in there, and it was just crazy. I was like, whoa, this is crazy. But yeah. one of the cool things about that specific trip that I had with my students was that I was on Twitter and I was just hyping up the program so much. I was and because I, I believed mm. in it, I was being encouraged. I was like, I'm gonna get these people on the map, like. People all over San Diego need to know about this program. Mm. And uh, it got to the point where the Qualcomm CEO started liking and retweeting stuff. And that wow. was the first time it had happened. So then later on, the employees there, I build relationships with them. 
And then it moved forward where now my job is an offset of the Qualcomm Thinkorbit lab. And it's been able to get me to where I'm at. Um, and, and, and anything else I would have to say that, so if the kids want to get their foot in the door, they want to get to the next level, I would say number one, just make sure you have a good attitude about things and be encouraging. And also this is going to be, um, it's going to be hard, but it's part of everything. Be able to be willing to work for free. Um, mm. if you really think about it, my social media posts, yeah. I was technically marketing for Qualcomm for free, mm-hmm. you know? Mm. So that was one. Right. Um, doing all those alumni interviews and uh, doing things to support USD at the beginning, that was all for free. That yeah. was all for free to do that. Um, even then, like as a, as a teacher, to go in your profession as an actual teacher, you need to do student teaching. And within the United States, it's just, I mean, that's another discussion for another day. But at mm-hmm. least in the way the United States has it, you do that program for free also. You actually pay. We mm-hmm. pay to do student teaching. So um, <laughs> it's one of those things where have a good attitude and be willing to work for free for a little bit. Because yeah. if people see that, they're going to see your soft skills. You're going to see your responsibility, your collaboration. They're going to be able to see how you communicate. And they're going to see that you have a positive attitude. And they're going to be like, wait a second, like, you deserve to be paid. Like, or yeah. if you apply for that job, they're like, wait, look at everything that that individual has been doing for this specific internship or job. And they're going to, you're going to be the first one on their list because you've been faithful. You've been loyal. You've been there. So I would yeah. definitely encourage anyone that wants to be, get the leg up, um, do it for free and do it with a positive attitude and uh, it'll take you a long way. You'll see. I like that positive attitude, do stuff for free. I definitely have done both and it's definitely helped me uh, a lot, not only in my professional uh, professional world, but uh, personally too, you know, even doing a podcast, something that I thought was going to be just for fun and just something to, to try out has been something that, you know, I've gotten a pretty good response from other students students that I didn't think were listening. They're like, Hey, Mr. G, right? Like, I like what you're doing with the podcast, that one episode. And so it's cool to get some good positive feedback and hear that, um, you know, that they're, they're getting the, they're receiving the content. Right. Um, yeah. So I guess a follow-up question is, you know, I'm curious, man, what's, what's next for you? I know you're always doing a lot of things, you know, you're working, you're doing your adjunct, you got your podcast, you're married, um, I know you just recently moved as well, but um, what's next for you? What projects are you currently working on or what are you uh, hoping to, to get started uh, very soon? Yeah, that's great. Um, well, first off, uh, the, I would have to say like right now, I, I enjoy what I'm doing. Um, I'm really trying to enjoy a season of consistency. Um, I've noticed that in order to really grow um, for a lot of different avenues, um, consistency is key. So Mm -hmm. I I honestly just want to kind of stay put, but at the same time with the things I'm doing outside of work, um, I actually, I'm trying to write a book entitled the innovative pedagogy. So based off the podcast, yeah, I already have all the chapters of all written. It's just, uh, I, I, uh, I, yeah, this uh, is exclusive guys. Exclusive. (laughs) (laughs) I should be repeat. I have the chapter titles all written out and the outlines actually I have the outline for everything. It's just a matter of just typing things in. But uh, I think like the hard work is done. It's just the, the, the scaffold has been set. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, um, I, I'm shooting for a release by the end of 2020. Um, wow. At, at least where it's been completely written out yeah. and then getting, getting it published sometime at the beginning of next, uh, before next school year. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, but uh, that's one of the biggest things. As you mentioned earlier, um, I do have my admin credential. Uh, my vision is um, I, I like what I'm doing right now. And the, the reality is I want to stay what I'm doing. I'm only in year eight. Um, and I was actually advised by one of my elementary school principals who ended up being one of my college professors and also student teaching supervisors at USD. Um, I kind of talked about where I wanted to go. And I said, hey, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I just want to be, I want to have the influence you had. Right. And uh, he, he advised that I would teach between 15 years and then do admin for another 15. Hmm. So, uh, I'm, I'm looking within the next seven or eight years um, to stay in the classroom. And then after that, I do want to uh, go into administration. Nice. And um, so uh, thankfully I already have my credential done. So it's just yeah, a matter right. of applying, yep. but, uh, but that would be it. And, uh, and the other thing is this, now this is a real big exclusive. Um, I'm actually thinking of starting a teaching mentorship program for wow. new teachers or veteran teachers that um, need support within ed tech. And um, it's That's something perfect, that man. I, yeah, so I'm actually, uh, I just had a meeting with uh, the board that I'm a part of with San Diego Q, 
And mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be hopefully launching that up in September um, to nice. do an academic year to be able to take at least five teachers under um, just my wing for mm -hmm. just a monthly book club, monthly check-in. And yeah. uh, just to have that network where teachers can feel like, hey, I have somebody to call. I have someone that can be mm -hmm. on support. Because, um, I mean, that's the time. We're living in times where people need relationships and people need support. Yeah. So um, be on the lookout for that. So, um, but yeah, those are the things we're doing right now. And uh, other than that, just to be able to take one day at a time, enjoy time with my <laughs> wife. And yep. uh, maybe apply to family in a year, next year and a half or two. So we'll see man. what happens. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you got your work cut out for you, man. You're trying to do a book before the end of the year, admin in the near future, and a teacher mentoring program. That's awesome. And it's timely. I think a lot of uh, educators, whether they're new, veterans, can definitely benefit from uh, your wealth of knowledge and expertise. So I'm excited for you. And just to kind of wrap up this podcast, something new that I want to start implementing in, in future episodes is, you know, what resource, whether that's a book, a podcast, um, uh, or maybe a, a leader that you respect um, that has recently um, taught you something. What is something that you can share with us for the people that are listening? What is one resource, whether it's a book, podcast, or a leader, or something else that has recently yeah. inspired you? Um, I would definitely have to um, say, um, if you have a Twitter account, you want to follow at DF Winters. Um, he's a mentor of mine. He's a leader, a school leader. Um, and one of the things that he's told me is, um, in any profession and anything that you do, um, every, every year. So for us, it's easy as educators, cause we start off like August or September and we can go through June, but yeah. uh, always pick that one thing. What's that one thing you're going to be improving on? What's that one thing you think you want to try? Um, and, and it's one of, it's kind of like a one year challenge it's, as far as like that one thing that you're going to try for one year. Um, and, and. And it really just brings a lot of balance. It brings a lot of strength. It brings a lot of growth. Mm -hmm. And um, so you can follow him. His name is Dr. Daniel Winters. He's a leader that um, he's for me, he's a leader of a lot of leaders and I really admire and respect him a lot. And uh, I would have to say, um, follow him on Twitter. He, uh, he yeah. posts a lot of, of good of, of wisdom. Um, he's involved with a lot of really powerful conversations as well. Um, and, uh, and making some really, really powerful decisions that are really influencing and making a big difference um and i would definitely have to do that and the other thing i would have to also say is uh for podcasts i would have to say that one of the best podcasts that i really enjoy listening to is uh, from um dr caroline leaf um she's mm. a psychologist and a neuroscientist in, uh, yep. based in australia new zealand but either way um i love the way she just analyzes just the effects of the brain and yep. um, especially during this pandemic, even this past week, she talked about um, just how the brain is impacted by media and, mm -hmm. um, and, and the things that media consumes. So it's, it's, it's almost like it's free counseling. It's free, like, you know, right. psychological yeah. support. So um, I would definitely give those two big shout out and uh, just jump on that if you can. Yeah, that's dope. So DF Winters and Dr. Caroline Leaf two great uh, people to follow and kind of get some more content. And if they want to get some of your content, where can they find uh, the innovative pedagogy or they can kind of like, just kind of pick your brain a little bit more about what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's easier to, uh, if I just say, just go to Chris Garcia 03. Um, you can find that on Twitter. Uh, if you go to Twitter, you'll be able to find the, uh, on my, the link in my bio or have it to the podcasts. And you'll also see the connection to the innovative pedagogy on there as well. Uh, you'll get to see a chance of what I'm doing on a daily basis. Um, every now and then, you'll probably might hear a little few few uh, sports rants uh, yep. from the Padres or. <laughs> I, I think I started to see a few of those recently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, but I mean, baseball's back, thankfully. Yeah. But uh, more importantly, you get to see a lot of the things that I get to do. Um, I do retweet retweet a lot of like leadership quotes and different leaders that I like to follow as well. But yeah, uh, yeah you can follow me on at from uh, Chris Garcia zero three um, on Twitter. Perfect. Well, Chris, man, um, I, I appreciate your time. Really just a lot of great stuff. Uh, proud of what all the stuff that you're doing in your life and just kind of your spheres of influence. So thank you again. Uh, hope to talk again, maybe in, in a later podcast and see, catch up and see about the, your book and the teacher mentor program and see how things are going. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Renato. It's been an honor. Thank you so much.